Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, my question now is going to be directed at all of you at uh, some point here. But you know, online courses. You know, we got we've got I've got grandchildren that can use these faster than they could talk almost. And so, so my question relates to that in a way. Uh, we're using online courses for both formal and informal education. And so, I guess the question question is this: Do we have any research? that tells us what online courses and how to make those effective? And then also, how does, how does online courses and what you're doing and this AI uh, relate to STEM education? We're carrying a bill about the STEM, uh, STEM careers and so on. So I'm gonna start with, at your left, my right, mm -hmm. and uh, move that away. So, that, so go ahead, thank you. Congressman Baird, let me just say that I think we realize that online education is here to stay. It's not going to take over all of education. It's not the best way for all of education. It's not the preferred learning style for uh, many. But we know, as I shared earlier with that single mom, she's got to have that opportunity to learn. So, so we have to, as educators, it's our responsibility to improve it constantly. Um, it's come through many iterations. It'll go through many more, but it'll also be hybrid and augmented and many things that as technologies we're talking about here today, ever greater enables us to make that online experience more real, more virtual, more uh, in, the, in the way that that learner wants to learn it. But I think we understand as community colleges, we have to lean in and it's not an either or, it's an and, it's a both and we need to continue to evolve. So we study, we look at, we know we have a gap between our face-to-face -face and our online learning. It's double di digit right now, which is not acceptable. So our goal is to eliminate that gap. That will be one measure of quality, but we will continue to look for ways to make that experience better for the online learner. So I would agree with my co-panelist here that it is a both and. Uh, we have a, a number of occupations that employers won't accept a fully virtual experience for, so they require some sort of hands-on. I'm not gonna let you touch an aircraft wing unless you have actually touched an aircraft wing before you come into my hangar, thankfully, right? Um, and yet, the promise of this is pretty profound. So if you think back to the statistics that I shared earlier in terms of the gap that we have facing us in manufacturing right now, the only way to close it is to become incredibly resourceful about who we bring in from the sidelines. Women are certainly one untapped resource, but what about people with physical and cognitive disabilities? Some of the greatest advancements made in digital technologies actually allows them to participate. The exoskeleton Dr. Lupia shared before is a marvelous example of how we can bring people in who before this have never even imagined of actually having the ability to participate in workforce. Um, strictly in online education and kind of what we think of as the standard, this is part of how Manpower Group is helping our associates upskill. We're offering um, all of our associates access to free education so that they can move up. With this idea, um, and just to validate what, what you were saying earlier, six to eight weeks, that's the, that's the ability of an individual who's working full time, sometimes two jobs, and raising kids. So it opens up more opportunity than we've ever seen before. Um, but it's not going to be the only way that we can educate because there are some things fundamentally that require hands-on. Uh, thank you for that question, Dr. Barrett. Uh, at MIT, we've been doing a lot with online education for quite a while. One of the, the first big courses that we did was an online circuits design course. Uh, a couple hundred thousand people took it. Uh, Nant Agarwal organized it. One of those students uh, was actually in Mongolia um, and got a perfect score um, on it. Uh, turned out to be a 17-year-old uh, boy. Um, and it was some, someone who wouldn't have been reached otherwise if there weren't this kind of technology. Uh, MIT went ahead and admitted him to the regular program, and it was somebody we probably wouldn't have found <laughs> otherwise. Um, we have put all of our uh, regular courses online through the op open courseware for free. People can just access and read and go. You can see my syllabi and, and, and see my lecture notes and, and, uh, and problem sets. There's also a, a, an online system called uh, uh, edX, it's a consortium of universities. It started with MITx, Harvard, and others joined that um, coordinates to have it in a more structured way so that you go through a, a curriculum. Um, and these are what are often called MOOCs, massive online courseware. 
Um, I think there was an early wave of hype and excitement about them you know, taking over and doing all sorts of things. Some of It worked very well in some areas, like the circuits course. It didn't work so well in others. Uh, it's certainly not a, a silver bullet. But I think there are uh, four things that we, we've learned. Um, one is that for many applications, uh, you can get enormous scale and much lower cost than we could have previously. Uh, secondly, there's a, one of the unexpected benefits was an ability to personalize. People learn at different rates, and there's different uh, media that work better for other people, and you can have things extremely customized and even personalized, and we're learning how to do that better. Thirdly, it often makes sense to do a hybrid system where you have people meet in person, uh, particularly for some of the, the softer skills we were talking about. We, we often combine where people will physically get together, know their classmates, do things together, then work separately online, and then come back together, which is actually how a lot of workforce works as well, uh, after all. And then uh, last but not least, in fact, probably most importantly, I think that the biggest lesson is that, that there is no one best way of doing it. What we need to do is continually experimenting and testing. The, the success of a lot of tech companies has been this uh, approach of A-B testing, constantly trying a new product, seeing if it works with different subsets of people. And we've very much taken that to heart with our online course offerings. And, and companies like Coursera, Udacity have been very successful in uh, trying things. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't but it's an attitude of experiment testing. Your question was spot on, like what is the research showing what working and what isn't working? And there's a whole set of things that have failed miserably, another set of things that have succeeded. But I think we're still in very early days, and the digital approach allows you to gather data at a, at a scale and cost and speed that just can't be matched in, in other ways. Well, thank you for asking that question. Um, at NSF, there's a foundation-wide effort to really support basic research on how to develop, evaluate, and improve online learning structures. Uh, one common way of doing it is you, you uh, collect a lot of information about the types of things people need to know. Uh, you, you correlate that with information about the types of uh, tasks that they may be asked to do. Uh, you integrate that with information about curricula and how people are doing in learning environments, and you take all that data together, and, and, and then you can really evaluate not just what does somebody remember after they take a test, but what can they do six months later. So there's all kinds of projects like that being funded at NSF, from trucking to farms to, there's even one for veterans. Uh, so uh, the idea is, you know, how do you structure curricula to help veterans who want to get into STEM pipelines, because veterans have special uh, abilities and sometimes special challenges. I guess the biggest headline in terms of what we've been doing recently is about a year ago, uh, the Boeing uh, company uh, gave $10 million to NSF to try and uh, really boost activity in this field. And uh, within the last few weeks, we've announced five new awards to study open source learning platforms to try and train and reskill workers at, at a larger scale. And so this work, these are just announced, is going to be done at University of Southern California, Purdue, Northeastern, Colorado School of Mines, and Oregon State University. They're all getting a, a couple million dollars to test some really big ideas they have in different ways. So it's like, a, what is it, co-optition or something? They're, they're doing it in different ways, but they're all going to be able to learn from each other. And I think this is, you know, our approach is to, is to fund a lot of different innovations in the hope that, you know, if some of them figure out something really innovative, it can be spread all over the country. Well, thank you, every one of you, and uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for letting us have that yeah. amount of time.